Shalom. Today we continue with the Gospel according to John. We're looking at the Hebraic background, what the context of the people of John's day would have understood about the events. We're in chapter 7, starting with verse 1. After these things, Yeshua walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you do. For there is no man that does anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Yeshua said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. You go up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then he went up also unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Yeshua is always talking about the right time. God has a right time for accomplishing everything. So why is he going up to the feast? There are three feasts which are required attendance in Jerusalem. They are called the Shalosh Regalim. Shalosh is three. Regalim from Regal, which means foot, the three pilgrimage feasts. From Exodus 23, three times you shall keep a feast unto me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you, in the time appointed in the month of Aviv. For in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. So these are the seven days following the Feast of Passover. Of course, the Feast of Passover, you must go up to the temple to slaughter the lamb. And then the people stayed for the days of unleavened bread. And the Feast of the Harvest, the first fruits of your labor, which you have sown in the field. This is a second feast, which is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Pentecost is required attendance. And finally, the Feast of Ingathering, which is the end of the year when you have gathered in your labors out of the field. Three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord, Yehovah. So the Feast of the Harvest, this is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. There is another festival called First Fruits, which occurs in the week of Passover. It is the first fruits of the barley harvest. And actually, it's not called First Fruits. It's called the beginning of the counting of the Omer. So these are the three feasts. Going up for Passover and unleavened bread, for Pentecost for Shavuot, the Feast of Week, and also going up for Sukkot, the final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the one that we're looking at in this story. Tabernacles is called Sukkot. It means booths or tabernacles. We read about it in Zechariah 14. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yehovah Tzivaot, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yehovah Tzivaot, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith Yehovah will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The reading of Zechariah is the prophet's reading for the Festival of Tabernacles. And this narration is prophesying a future event when all the nations will come up. And we will see that Tabernacles is a holiday for all nations. In Numbers 29, 12 through 34, we see the offerings of each successive day of the seven days of Sukkot. And on the first day, 13 young bullocks are offered, and the second day, 12, 11, and counting down to the seventh day, when seven are offered for a total of 70. 70 always represents the number of the nations. In Numbers 10, Table of Nations, you see 70 names there. And in the Talmud is written in Shabbat 88, B. Every single word that went forth from the omnipotent was split up into 70 languages at Sinai. So 70 represents the nations, that all the nations will come 
Now, Yeshua is the sinless Messiah. He's going to keep all the laws of Torah, including those for the Shalosh Regalim, for the three holidays, when the males are required to go up to Jerusalem. Continuing in verse 11, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceives the people. Howbeit no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Well, they're all Jews. They're not talking about fear. He's not afraid of Jews. Everybody in the whole country is Jews. The people are afraid of the authorities. Verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Yeshua went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never learned? Yeshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you go about to kill me? So in the tradition of teaching, this is an example of how rabbinical teaching was made. And so this is just an excerpt. The commentary is about Genesis 1 and this verse. And God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them dominate over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over the animals and over the earth, blah, blah, blah. This is the commentary. Rabbi Tarhuma, in the name of Rabbi Benaiah and Rabbi Berchia, in the name of Rabbi Eliezer, said, when the Holy One, blessed be he, created Adam, the first man, created him in the unformed state, and he was blah, 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 blah. Continuing, Rabbi Yehoshua bar Nechemia and Rabbi Yehuda bar Shimon, in the name of Rabbi Eliezer, said, he created him filling the whole world from east to west. And from where? From where is that derived? So the point is not to understand the commentary. The point is to see that the teaching is the this rabbi says this in the name of this rabbi who says it in the name of this rabbi and all the teachings have this protocol of authorities elsewhere we see people question Yeshua under what authority because they're looking for a teaching that looks like this rabbi a in the name of rabbi b in the name of rabbi c and he just comes and says my doctrine comes straight from the father i don't have this protocol of authorities continuing in verse 20 the people answered and said, You have a devil who goes about to kill you. Yeshua answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And you on the Shabbat day circumcise a man. If a man on the Shabbat day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So previously in chapter 5, we saw the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And Yeshua said, take up your mat. And it was Shabbat. So that is the one work that he mentions here. It is well documented that circumcision is allowable on Shabbat and in fact ordained in the Talmud. Rather, this is the reason for the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. As the verse says, and on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. That's quoted from Leviticus 12.3, indicating that he is circumcised on the eighth day, even it falls on Shabbat. There is a precept called pikuach nefesh, the saving of a life, which is mentioned elsewhere. Saving a life overrides Shabbat. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah answered and said, just as the mitzvah of circumcision, which rectifies only one of the 248 limbs of the body, regardless of whether there are 248 limbs of the body or not, overrides Shabbat, so too, a fortiori, saving one's whole body, which is entirely involved in mitzvot, overrides Shabbat. So what Yeshua did was perfectly in accordance with the rabbi's teaching. Continuing in verse 24, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Messiah? Howbeit we know this man whence he is. But when Messiah comes, no man knows whence he is. So there is a principle of the appearance and disappearance of the Messiah. Now, they know, and we see, when the Magi show up, they know where Messiah is going to be born. 
It's prophesied in the book of Micah. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. But there is also a parallel, for example, in Melchizedek, who is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, and abides as a priest continually. Remember, they're arguing. We know this man. We know his mother. We know his father. We know where he comes from. He came from the wrong place. But there's also this contemporaneous idea that when Messiah comes, he will appear and disappear and reappear. It's written in Sanhedrin 97a. There are three matters that come only by means of diversion of attention from those matters. In other words, when you're unaware of something, that's when it happens. These are the three. The Messiah, a lost item, and a scorpion. So you're not going to see the Messiah if you're looking for him. It's when you're not looking for him that he shows up. And there are many citations of, oh, he's here. Oh, no, he's there. Oh, he's there. Also from an interpretation of the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 9. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. A roe appears and is hid, appears and is hid again. So our first redeemer, Moses, remember we said Yeshua is going to be like Moses, the Messiah is going to be like Moses. He appeared and was hid, and at length appeared again. He was there in Egypt, he went off to Midian, and he returned. He was at the bottom of the mountain, he went up the mountain, he came down the mountain. Again, he went up the mountain and he came down the mountain, this disappearing and reappearing. So our latter redeemer, the Messiah, shall be revealed to them and shall be hid from them. And how long shall he be hid from them? A little after, or maybe 45 days, or maybe 2,000 years. Continuing in verse 28, then cried Yeshua in the temple as he taught, saying, you both know me and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, But he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When the Messiah comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Yeshua unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me, and shall not find me, for where I am, thither you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, You shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither you cannot come? In the last day, the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Yeshua was not yet glorified. Now we come to the religious background of this statement of Yeshua. It's the last day of the holiday of tabernacles. And this is a ritual which is not mentioned at all in Torah, but it is well documented in the Talmud. And this is what was taking place. It is called the water pouring ceremony in Hebrew, Simchat Bet HaShoeva, the rejoicing of the house of the drawing of water. And it's documented in these places in Sukkah 4 and 5 in the Talmud. Golden candelabra were placed there in the courtyard with four golden basins at the top of each and four ladders were put to each candelabrum on which stood four lads from the rising youth of the priesthood holding jars of oil containing 120 jugs with which they replenished each basin. The cast off breeches and belts of the priests were torn into shreds for wicks which they lighted. There was not a court in Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the lights of the water drawing. Pious and distinguished men danced before the people with lighted flambeau in their hands and sang hymns and lauds before them. And the Levites accompanied them with harps, psalteries, cymbals, and numberless musical instruments. The flute is played on the festival of Sukkot for five or six days. 
It was said that there wasn't a woman in Jerusalem who could not examine grain in the palm of her hand by the light of the courtyard of these candelabra that were lit. It is understood that this ritual symbolizes the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 12, 3, Therefore with joy you shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. Continuing with the ritual, the priests went down to the pool of Siloam and brought the water libation back to the temple. The shofar was sounded as an expression of joy. There were two silver basins at the altar one for water and one for wine. The two basins were perforated at the bottom with two thin perforated nose-like protrusions. One of the basins used for the wine libation had a perforation that was broad and one used for the water libation had a perforation that was thin so that the flow of both the water and the wine, which do not have the same viscosity, would conclude simultaneously. The basin to the west of the altar was for water. The basin to the east of the altar was for wine. So they bring the water from the pool of Siloam, and then they have the wine, and they have these two pitcher-like things on either side of the altar, and they pour the wine and the water at the same time, and both of them run down the side of the altar, and according to the size of the hole of each basin, moderates the speed of the flow so that the two things flow at the same time. It is said that one who has never seen the celebration in the place of the water drawing ceremony has never seen celebration in his life. It is the most joyous day. Now the simultaneous flowing of the water and the wine should remind us of the crucifixion, John 19:34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Just as we talked about Moses bringing the manna and Yeshua bringing the bread, they also acknowledged that the latter redeemer is to procure water for them, just as Moses did in fulfillment of many scriptures. Isaiah 58:11, And Yehovah shall guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and make fat your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Joel 3.18 And it shall come to pass in that day, that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of Jehovah, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Isaiah 44, 3, For I will pour water on him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon your seed, and my blessing upon your offspring. Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters, and he that has no money, come, buy, and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Again from Zechariah 14, which is the reading for the holiday of Tabernacles. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. And in that day there shall be one Jehovah, and his name shall be one. Also Ezekiel 47, Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looks eastward, and behold, there ran waters on the right side. Some years ago, there appeared waters running by the western wall, and everybody got quite excited about a fulfillment of a prophecy, but it turned out it was a broken pipe. Continuing in John 7, verse 40, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. But some said, Shall Messiah come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said, that Messiah comes of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was. So there was division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they say unto them, Why haven't you brought him? The officers answered, 
Never man spoke like this man. Wherever Yeshua goes, there is division. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knows not the law, are cursed. And just in the nick of time, a Pharisee shows up. Nicodemus says unto them, He that came to Yeshua by night, being one of them, Does our law judge any man before it hears him, and know what he does? They answered and said unto him, Are you also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. And every man went unto his house. Would you be surprised to learn that a prophet did arise out of Galilee? In 2 Kings 14.25, it's talking about something that one of the kings of Israel did. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamat to the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of Jehovah, God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which is Gatefer. So you all know about Jonah, and this is that, the same Jonah. He's the son of Amittai. And he lives in a town, Gat Hefer. So where is Gat Hefer? We find out in Joshua 19, 10 and 13, when the land is being allotted to the tribes. And the third lot came up for the children of Zvulun, Zebulon, according to their families. And the border of their inheritance was unto Sarid. And from thence passes on along to the east of Gat Hefer, to Itach Kazin, and goes out to Rabon Metoar, to Nea. So we find out that Gathefer is in the allotment of Zvulun, and Matthew 4.15 tells us the land of Zvulun and the land of Naphtalim by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. So it turns out that the prophet who is from Galilee is Jonah. And here's a map, and here's where Gathefer is, and you can see the Sea of Kinneret is up the Sea of Galilee is up a little bit to your right, and this is the region that's known as the Lower Galilee. Finally, we see at the ruckus at the end of John that every man goes to his home, and this reminds us of another event. When the people were divided after Absalom tried to take the throne from his father David, the people had already been divided by Saul, who was from a different tribe. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so after Absalom was killed, the the people were in a state of disarray. And of course, the people from the tribe of Judah wanted David to come back. But there was a rebel in 2 Samuel 21. There happened to be a man of Belial, Belial, which means actually a worthless person. And it can mean a rebel. His name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So we have this foreshadow of people who, by genetic right, belong to the kingdom, but they don't want anything to do with David. They want nothing to do with the greater son of David, Yeshua. And every man just goes home. Until next time, Tasimita Inayim al Hashamayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.